Welcome back to Intersections, a podcast series in which we're exploring when and where the supernatural spirit world intersected with the world of the Bible and where a specific supernatural event occurred. In our last two episodes, we examined the supernatural events that occurred during the life and ministry of Jesus. Today, we're wrapping up this series as we examine the remaining supernatural events in the New Testament. All but three of them are recorded in the book of Acts. The other three are found in the Apostle Paul's two letters to the Corinthians. The Bible is incredibly interconnected with threads that run through it from beginning to end. In this podcast, I will uncover these threads, help you dig deeper into God's truth, and inspire you to live your life with greater confidence and joy. Welcome to Bible Threads with me, Dr. Bruce Becker. But before we get to today's episode, I want to share some exciting news with you. Remember my earlier series about true crimes of the Bible? If you missed it, you can just scroll down this feed to find it. Well, the Time of Grace team turned it into a book. That means that those people who prefer to read books instead of listen to podcasts, well, there's another way you can learn all about the true crimes of the Bible. Explore some of Scripture's most shocking tales of corruption, violence, confession, and redemption. From Cain's murder of his brother to Paul's complicity in a public execution, you'll investigate cases of horrific sin and extravagant grace as you uncover the truth of God's holiness, His justice, mercy, and love. Just visit timeofgrace.org to find out how you can get a copy of of my new book, True Crimes of the Bible. As the book of Acts begins, we have an account of Jesus' final days on this earth before he ascended into heaven. During the 40 days between Jesus' resurrection and his ascension, he appeared to his disciples and followers on multiple occasions. In some cases, he just miraculously appeared out of nowhere. The book of Acts tells us, After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. In addition to the appearances of Jesus that are recorded in the four Gospels and the book of Acts, the Apostle Paul mentions several appearances in his first letter to the Corinthians. In what's known as the Great Resurrection chapter, chapter 15, we read this, He appeared to Peter, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than five hundred of the brothers at the same time. Most of them are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. Jesus' appearance to the five hundred and the appearance to James are not recorded in any of the four Gospels or the book of Acts, only here in 1 Corinthians. As I mentioned in a previous episode, Acts chapter 1 tells us about Jesus' supernatural ascent into heaven, followed by the appearance of two angels who showed up to tell the sky-gazing disciples that Jesus would come back one day in the same way the disciples saw him go into heaven. And won't that be an awesome day when he returns? One of the most amazing supernatural events recorded in the book of Acts occurred ten days after Jesus' ascension. It occurred on a day known as Pentecost. Before his ascension, Jesus had told his disciples not to leave Jerusalem, but to stay there to wait for a gift that they would receive from God the Father. That gift would be the Holy Spirit. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. 
all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them. The supernatural Spirit of God showed up in the lives of Jesus' disciples, accompanied by wind and fire. On that day, the Spirit empowered the disciples to speak in other known languages, languages that they apparently had never learned. So, what's the significance of what happened on this day? There's a little bit to unpack here. Pentecost was the Greek word for an important Old Testament festival known as the Feast of Harvest or the Festival of Weeks. In Hebrew, the festival was called Shavuot. The word Pentecost means 50th. This feast took place 50 days after the Passover Sabbath, which Jesus had celebrated with his disciples the evening before he was arrested and crucified. Many Jews, if not most, would travel to Jerusalem to celebrate the Festival of Weeks, Shavuot. With the large number of people in Jerusalem to celebrate the festival, people from many different countries, the Spirit's power enabled the disciples to communicate the good news message about Jesus to thousands of people simultaneously, each in their own language. As a result, Thousands of people that day came to know and believe in Jesus. But why did this outpouring of the Holy Spirit occur on the Festival of Weeks? Well, first, the Festival of Weeks had a dual focus. It was an agricultural celebration marking the spring wheat harvest. But it also had a spiritual focus, marking the day the Lord God gave His law on Mount Sinai to Moses and entered into a covenant relationship with his chosen people, the nation of Israel. So think about this. The Old Testament Jewish people celebrated the Passover to mark being set free from slavery in Egypt. They celebrated Shavuot to mark their new relationship with the Lord God as his chosen people. Now, when Jesus was sacrificed on the cross as the Lamb of God, he set us free from our slavery to sin and Satan. Then 50 days later, the Holy Spirit showed up on Pentecost to establish a new relationship between God and us, His church. This wasn't a coincidence. It's how God planned it. It's how God plans everything. One day after Pentecost, Peter and John were going up to the temple in Jerusalem at the time of prayer, which was three o'clock in the afternoon. At one of the gates into the temple grounds was a beggar, a man crippled from birth. The beggar asked Peter and John for some money. Peter responded, Silver or gold I do not have, but what I have I give you, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Walk. And the man got up and walked. In fact, he went into the temple courts walking, jumping, and praising God. One of the characteristics of the early Christian church was that believers shared everything they owned with other believers. One example of this was a man by the name of Joseph, a Levite from the island of Cyprus. He sold a field that he owned and brought the money to the apostles. But you probably know him not as Joseph but by the name given to him by the apostles. His new name was Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. Then we read about another couple who also sold a piece of property. Their names were Ananias and Sapphira. They brought some of the money from the sale of the property to the apostle Peter. Now, giving just some of the money from the sale would have been just fine, but they did it deceptively. They claimed that the money they gave was the entire amount from the sale. As Peter pointed out, they lied to God about their gift. As a result, the Lord God stepped into their lives and ended their lives. First Ananias, and then three hours later, Sapphira. The Bible makes it clear that God loves a cheerful giver, but not a deceptive giver. 
As the days and weeks went on, the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders among the people. People brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats, so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by evil spirits, and all of them were healed. Jesus' medical miracles were now being repeated by his disciples. Although many people appreciated what the apostles were doing, some did not, namely the Jewish religious leaders. The high priest and his associates were jealous of all the attention the apostles were getting as they proclaimed the name of Jesus. So the high priest had the apostles arrested and thrown into jail. But that night, an angel from heaven came and opened the doors of the jail. The angel told the apostles to go back to the temple courts and continue to proclaim the message of the new life that Jesus had secured for all people. In Acts chapter 6 and 7, we are introduced to a man by the name of Stephen. Stephen was a man full of God's grace and power and did great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. As a result, Stephen was also targeted by the Jewish religious leaders. They seized him and brought him before the Sanhedrin, which was the ruling body among the Jewish people. Stephen gave a lengthy speech, recounting the history of God's Old Testament people who consistently disobeyed the Lord God and worshipped false gods. Then Stephen made an application to the religious leaders of his day. He said, you stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your fathers did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him, namely Jesus. At this, the religious leaders became furious and dragged him out of the city to stone him to death. But before they did, Stephen experienced a supernatural event, which he tells us in his own words. He says, Look, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And guess who was in the crowd giving approval to the stoning of Stephen? He was a man named Saul. More on his supernatural encounter with Jesus in just a bit. Next, we hear about a man named Philip. We first meet Philip in Acts chapter 6. He was one of the seven men chosen to assist the apostles with the care of the widows and the daily distribution of food to those widows. By the way, Stephen was one of the seven as well. Philip, like the apostles and Stephen, performed miracles. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Christ there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the miraculous signs he did, they all paid close attention to what he said. With shrieks, evil spirits came out of many, and many paralytics and cripples were healed. And many in Samaria believed the good news about Jesus that Philip had taught. One day, an angel came to Philip and said, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. On the road, Philip meant uh, an Ethiopian, a man in charge of the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. Philip taught the Ethiopian about the prophecies in Isaiah that look forward to the coming of Jesus. Philip then baptized the Ethiopian, and when he came up out of the water, the Holy Spirit supernaturally took Philip away. Recall earlier when we examined the Apostle Paul's letter to the Corinthians when he wrote, Last of all, he appeared to me as to one abnormally born? Well, Paul was referring to the day when Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus, when he was still called Saul and was still persecuting the first century Christian church. Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples, He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, a name for the followers of Christ, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. 
As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Saul opened his eyes to discover that he was blind. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man named from Tarsus named Saul. Go there, place your hands on Saul, and restore his sight. Now, Ananias was reluctant to go because of Saul's reputation, but he went and restored Saul's sight. What a remarkable story of God's grace in calling Saul to become Paul, the New Testament's greatest missionary. By the way, if you travel to Damascus today in the oldest part of the city, you will still find a street called Straight Street. The story in Acts now shifts back to more supernatural events done by the Apostle Peter. One day Peter went to the town of Lydda. Lydda was located about 20 miles northwest of Jerusalem. There Peter encountered a man named Aeneas, a paralytic, who had been bedridden for the previous eight years. Peter healed him in the name of Jesus. Then Peter traveled to Joppa, a city on the Mediterranean coast. Today it's known as Jaffa, in the far western part of the city of Tel Aviv. There in Joppa was a disciple named Tabitha. That was her Hebrew name. In Greek, her name was Dorcas. Dorcas was always doing good and helping the poor by making clothes for them to wear. But one day she died. So two men came to Peter and asked him to come, and Peter did. He prayed over Tabitha and said, Tabitha, get up, and she did. Peter was given the supernatural power to raise even the dead. Peter's next supernatural encounter involved a man named Cornelius. Cornelius was a Gentile centurion in the Italian regiment of the Roman army. He and his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel who said, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a remembrance before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon who is called Peter. Well, Cornelius sent two of his servants and one of his soldiers to Joppa. About noon the following day, as the three men were approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat, and while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals, as well as reptiles of the earth and birds of the air. Then a voice told him, Get up, Peter. Kill and eat. Oh, surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. While Peter was thinking about this vision, the Holy Spirit came to him and said, Simon, three men are looking for you. Get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. The next day, Peter and the three men left Joppa and headed to Caesarea, about 35 miles north of Joppa. At Cornelius' house, and remember, Cornelius was not of the Jewish people. There was a large group of people comprised of Cornelius' relatives and friends. After hearing Cornelius' testimony about his encounter with an angel, Peter spoke some very significant words. He said, 
I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. Peter then continued with talking about Jesus, who he was, and what he did for Jew and Gentile alike. While Peter was speaking, the Holy Spirit showed up again and was poured out on all the people there, even the Gentiles. The people began to speak in other languages and praise God. And then everyone was baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. That was a supernatural event I would have loved to see in person. How about you? There's one final supernatural event involving Peter that's recorded in the book of Acts. Up until this time, it was the Jewish leaders who led the persecution of the first century Christians. But now King Herod got involved. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. When he saw that this pleased the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Do the math. Sixteen soldiers guarded Peter. The night before Herod was going to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and sentries who stood guard at the entrance. That night, an angel showed up in the prison. The angel woke Peter up. The chains fell off of Peter's wrists. He got dressed and walked out of the prison with the angel. When they got to the iron gate which led to the city, it opened by itself. The angel walked with Peter for one block and then disappeared. Peter was a free man. Now, King Herod, after executing the guards who were supposed to be guarding Peter, left Judea and went to his palace in Caesarea. One day, Herod decided to give a public address to the people. The people responded by shouting, This is the voice of God, not of a man. Because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel struck Herod down. He was eaten by worms and died. The remaining supernatural events in the book of Acts all involve the Apostle Paul and his co-workers. After being commissioned by the church in Antioch, Paul and Barnabas set off on their first missionary journey. Their first stop was the island of Cyprus, where they encountered a really bad dude, Elimas, who was a sorcerer. Elimas tried to prevent Paul from sharing the gospel with the proconsul Sergius Paulus. So Paul pronounced judgment on Elimas, stating that the Lord's hand was against him. At that very moment, Elimas lost his sight. He was totally blind. Paul and Barnabas next headed to the mainland, which would be modern-day Turkey, to the city of Pisidian Antioch. From there, they traveled to Iconium and then to Lystra. In Lystra, Paul healed a man with crippled feet that he had had from birth. Now, because of this miracle, the people of Lystra thought that Paul and Barnabas were gods. And it was also in Lystra that some Jews came from Iconium and Antioch to get Paul. They dragged him out of the city and stoned him and left him for dead. From Lystra, Paul and Barnabas headed to Derbe, preaching the good news of Jesus wherever they went. They then returned to Antioch, stopping at Lystra and Iconium on their way back. On his second missionary journey in the city of Philippi, Paul and his co-workers met a slave girl who had a spirit that could predict the future. She made a lot of money for her owners by fortune-telling. She followed Paul and the others, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God, who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so troubled that he turned around and said to the Spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the Spirit left her. If you know the rest of the story, you know that the owners of the slave girl were none too happy, and Paul and Silas ended up in jail. 
At midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns. Then there was an earthquake, and the prison doors flew open, and the chains fell off of all the prisoners. The jailer thought that all the prisoners had escaped, so he was about to kill himself. Paul shouted, Don't do that. We're all here. Then the jailer asked, What must I do to be saved? And Paul told him, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. One night in the city of Corinth, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision, encouraging him not to be afraid, but to keep on proclaiming the gospel message despite opposition. So Paul stayed in Corinth for another year and a half. On his third missionary journey, Paul witnessed the Holy Spirit being poured out on twelve men who were disciples from the city of Ephesus. They also spoke in other languages and prophesied. The Spirit's power was at work through Paul. Also in Ephesus, Paul performed other unusual supernatural events. The book of Acts simply says, God did extraordinary miracles through Paul. One of the most outstanding supernatural events occurred in the city of Troas, where Paul was preaching all night long. At midnight, we learned that there was a young man who was sitting on a third-story window ledge. His name was Eutychus. Well, he fell asleep and fell from the window to the ground below. The fall killed him. But Paul went down the stairs, threw himself on the young man, and put his arms around him. Don't be alarmed, Paul said. He's alive. And he was. One night after Paul had stood trial before the Sanhedrin back in Jerusalem, the Lord stood near to Paul and said, Take courage. As you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. On that journey to Rome, the ship uh, Paul was on was shipwrecked off the island of Malta. The islanders showed unusual kindness to the shipwrecked crew and passengers. They built a fire, and when Paul put some wood on the fire, a poisonous viper bit Paul and fastened itself on his hand. The islanders thought Paul was a murderer, and though he escaped shipwreck, he wasn't going to escape justice. But Paul shook the viper off and suffered no ill effects. Yet another medical miracle. From the shore, Paul and his companions went to the estate of the ruler of the island, a man named Publius. Publius's father was very sick, and once again, through the power that God gave him, Paul healed the man. There is one final supernatural event in the life and ministry of Paul. It was a vision of heaven that occurred sometime between his second and third visit to Corinth. He described being caught up to the third heaven, where he heard things that he was unable to express and not permitted to tell. In my podcast series entitled, The Grand Ands of the Bible, I go into a bit more detail about what this third heaven may have been. It's in the episode entitled, Heaven and Earth. Check it out if you're interested. Well, that wraps up our, our series called Intersections. It's my prayer that over these 10 episodes, you were able to appreciate even more the amazing ways the supernatural showed up in the world of the Bible, especially how the Lord God blessed his people. It's an incredible Bible thread that speaks powerfully to God's grace. So what's next? Well, let me give you a glimpse of our next podcast series. It's called Traitors, More Than Just the Seven Deadly Sins. In it, we'll explore people throughout the Bible who were traitors to God and others with their bad attitudes and sinful actions. And don't be shocked. They are the same attitudes and actions that we can experience in our own lives. Traitors, More Than Just the Seven Deadly Sins. Join me, won't you? Thanks for listening, and God bless.